Our sermon text for today comes from the book of Revelation. It's chapter 13 and the last verse of chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, chapter 12, beginning in verse 17, and then we'll read all 18 verses of chapter 13. Revelation 12, and I'll begin reading in verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Now chapter 13, verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was also allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has ear, an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the faith, for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all authority, all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, It deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both slave and free, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. This is God's word. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, separation of church and state. It's used all the time in our society today. It's it's been popular for close to 100 years now. Many in our country use this phrase to argue that religion cannot be used as a foundation for the laws in our country. Uh, that when it, you know, when it comes time for the government to determine what's going to be legal or illegal, you've got to leave your religious views at the door. This phrase has been used to argue that prayers can't be offered in public schools, that religious nonprofit organizations cannot receive government funding, though other nonprofits doing precisely the same activities can. And it's been used to argue that the phrase one nation under God is in the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional. But that's not where the phrase comes from. Do you know the origin of the phrase separation of church and state? It originally had nothing to do with any of those issues. In 1801, a group of Baptist pastors in Danbury, Connecticut. Faithful Baptist pastors, let me add, just because you know, not all Baptists have been faithful over the years. 
Faithful Baptist pastors wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson congratulating him on being elected the third president of the United States. At that time in Connecticut, there was an established church. And that meant that every citizen of Connecticut had to either pay taxes to support the established church or get permission from the state of Connecticut to attend a church of a different denomination. That's the way most states were uh, at the revolutionary period. Well, these Baptist pastors did not like having to get that permission. And so they wrote to Thomas Jefferson, a man who was known for his views on religious liberty, and said, we don't think this is right, but we're praying for you, and we're praying that through your influence over time, laws like this might change, and we can worship God without any kind of restriction from the state. And Jefferson wrote back to the Danbury Baptists and said, quote, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, there should be a wall of separation between church and state. And then two days after Thomas Jefferson wrote that letter, he went to a religious worship service. Now, why do I bring, uh, other than the fact that I like history, why did I bring that little historical trivia up in the middle of a sermon? Because as we study our text for today, we're going to have to think about what it looks like for Christians in the United States to relate to our government. That's what this chapter is about. Now, if you're new to Grace Bible or if you're a visitor, I'm so glad you're here, and I just want you to know we don't preach about politics every single week. In fact, I, I'm kind of allergic to that kind of preaching where everything turns political. Our practice instead is to teach through books of the Bible. And back on May 1st, we started teaching in the book of Revelation. Last week, Drew preached on Revelation 12. So this week, I'm in Revelation 13. Next week, we're going to be, Lord willing, in Revelation 14. Uh, and that's how we do it in our church. Not, not skipping over any difficult passages. I mean, if we want to skip over difficult passages, we wouldn't have picked Revelation in the first place, right? But studying the Bible as it comes to us. So I have one point to my sermon this morning. I can't remember the last time I preached on politics, and I can't remember I only had the last time I had one point in my sermon. But I have one point. Don't get too excited. It's not going to be a shorter sermon than usual. But I promise you'll be, in time, you'll be out in time to watch the Rebels play ball. My one point is this. Through the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, God charges us to understand who the beasts are and what they do. So we're going to study these beasts in Revelation 12 and 13 this morning. And then at the end of the sermon, hang in there because we're going to be, I'm going to be teaching for a little while. But hang in there and at the end, I'll give you some application. So my first and only point, God charges us to understand the beasts. That is clear, that is crystal clear from the last verse in our passage, verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for his number of man and his number is 666. So it's clear. Not 666. That's not clear. We'll come back to that in a little while. But it's clear that we're charged to understand these beasts. How many beasts did you read about in our passage for today? Now, if you're not careful... You'd say two, but I've very deliberately included the last part of Revelation 12 to make it clear there's three beasts in our passage. The first beast we read about is the dragon, and as Drew talked about last week, the dragon is a symbol for Satan or the devil. We believe in this church. That there's a real, supernatural, powerful being called the devil. He's not all-powerful. He is not on par with God. He, he, is nothing, he is created. He is not the creator. But he's powerful. Yet he's not powerful enough to take on God. And he hates the fact that God has all the glory and God has all the power. 
And he hates the fact that he rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven, as Drew talked about last week. So the devil can't take on God to express this rage. What does he do instead? Now we'll go to the very first verse in our passage today, chapter 12, verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The devil can't win a fight against God, so what does he do? He goes after God's people, the church. But how does the devil do this, according to Revelation 13? That gets us to the second beast. He gives power to the the beast out of the sea. Now, I want you to notice several things about the beast out of the sea. Verse 2, chapter 13, we read, And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Now, does that remind you of anything, some other passage maybe that was just read this morning by Rihanna Reader a little while ago? That is clearly a reference to Daniel 7. So if you want to know what Revelation 13, 2 means, we read Daniel 7. And in the book of Daniel, we read that those four beasts represent four mighty kingdoms that existed before the birth of Christ who were all opposed to God and his people. But now in Revelation, John sees a beast. He doesn't see four beasts, does he? He sees one beast who is a composite of all the other beasts. And this beast is mighty. He has ten horns with ten diadems or jeweled crowns on the horns, all symbols of strength. Verse 2 says, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority to this beast. And verse 7 says that this beast has authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. And we also read in verse 3, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So this beast dies, but then it comes back to life. You kill it, you think you're rid of it, but in a few years, a few decades, it's right back doing its evil work again. Now, as I think we've said every week, Revelation is full of symbols, and symbols by definition require interpretation. And it's not always easy to know how to precisely interpret the symbols in Revelation. Good Christians can disagree on interpretation. But I believe that John means for us to understand that the beast out of the sea has something to do with human government. Or another word might be the state. Now, it's not that that government itself is the beast. Romans 13.1, Paul says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So the Bible is very clear. You know, primarily, government exists for our good. Without government, there'd be anarchy and chaos, okay? We'd have to shoot our way into town to go to Kroger and get our groceries and shoot our way back home in order to be, you know, get home safely. I mean, it would be terrible without government. And it should go without saying that many, many faithful Christians have and continue to serve as officials in our government. But the beast out of the sea, I think the best way to understand it, is a demonic force powered by Satan to corrupt what God has made good. Therefore, under the power of the beast, government has and will continue to be at some place and some time an instrument with which the devil makes war on God's people, the church. You know, in the first century, as John's writing his letters and his gospel, Rome, under the emperor's Nero and Domitian were crucifying followers of Jesus and feeding them to the lions. And it continues to happen today. Did you know that there have been more Christian martyrs in the last hundred years than in the first 
1,900 years of the church combined? Who did all that killing? You know, was it gangs? Was that gang violence that killed all those Christians? Was it um, uh, burglars breaking into houses? No. It was the state. It was the communist governments of the Soviet Union and China and the Khmer Rouge and Cambodia each killed millions to try to destroy the church in those countries. Now, some, some pastors, and this is something else I say every week, some pastors teach that Revelation, and particularly chapter 13, was written by the Apostle John about events that will take place at some point in our future. So thousands and thousands of years in John's future. That's how they interpret this part of Revelation. But nowhere, you would think if that was the case, John would say something like this. Just one verse, right? Hey, guys, I'm writing all this to you, but I want you to know that it probably isn't going to happen for about 3,000 years, so you don't have to really worry about it. We don't get a hint of any of that anywhere in the book of Revelation. All 22 chapters of it are for the church in John's day. And that's why he says in verse 10 of chapter 13, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. He's saying this beast is working now. It's going to work throughout all of church history, perverting government to do its evil work. And the, and the beast continues its grisly work today. You know, you get rid of one evil government in the country. It has a mortal wound, you know, like in verse 3. And then what happens? It just pops back up somewhere else and continues on its work. So John is telling his readers and he's telling us, be ready, know who this beast is, understand what he does, don't be surprised when the suffering comes. Now we'll talk about the third beast, the beast out of the earth. But from now on, I'm not going to call it the third beast. I'm going to call it the false prophet. Because that's how he's referred to in the rest of Revelation. Revelation 16, 13, 19, 20, and 2010. He's called the false prophet. And that's helpful for understanding who this third beast is. He is a prophet. That means he's someone that even Christians will be tempted to listen to. We read in verse 11, the false prophet had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. Now, who else in the book of Revelation is described as a lamb? Do you remember from a few weeks ago? Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay, so Revelation 5, 6, that lamb, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He has seven horns, all power. Well, this, this false prophet is, looks like a lamb, but he has two horns, and he speaks with the voice of the dragon. He is a poor copy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Revelation 13 is telling us that, that he is a false prophet trying to point people away from the true Christ and instead lead everyone, even people in the church, into worshiping the beast, into worshiping the power of the state. You know, it's funny. Uh, somebody pointed this out to me a few weeks ago. In the early church, they weren't particularly worried about dying for the faith. I think a lot of them kind of expected they would die. I mean, they saw it all around them. They were, their friends were being carried off and killed all the time. But you know what they were terrified of? They weren't scared of death, but they were terrified of being deceived. And so all through the New Testament, the, the Gospels, the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter, the letters of John, the letter of Jude, you have all these warnings about false teachers and false prophets and don't be led astray and John is just continuing that theme in the book of Revelation now you may think JD I've got a lot of problems but one thing I'm not worried about happening is me being led astray by some false prophet to start worshiping the United States government okay if that's what you think let me just give you one example from history in 1933, 
Adolf Hitler and the Nazis came to power. And you know, we look back on that and say, how in the world, how in the world could that have ever happened? Well, we don't know our history. At that time in history, Germany was in complete and utter chaos because of the Great Depression, because of World War I. And Adolf Hitler and the Nazis said, if you put us in power, we'll straighten everything out. We will return Germany to her glorious past. We're going to start a thousand-year kingdom. Nobody's going to look down on Germany anymore. And we'll get rid of all those godless communists that are taking over the rest of Europe as well. Therefore, actually, a lot of Christians voted for Adolf Hitler in 1932. But then he said this. He said, there is one catch. If we're going to become a great power again... We've got to get rid of those Jews. They're the ones responsible for all your problems. And we've even got to get rid of those Jews who have become Christian. You know, those people who were born into Jewish families, but then were born again by the Holy Spirit into the blood of Jesus Christ. The Nazis, as soon as they came to power, began pushing for a single state church that reported ultimately to Adolf Hitler to bring the power of the German people together because that's the only way it's ever going to work is if we all come together. And no one of any Jewish blood could be a member, let alone a pastor. And to their great shame, the majority of Christians in Germany went along with it. They called themselves, quote-unquote, the German Christians because they said you can't really be a Christian in Germany unless you have pure Aryan blood. You can't be a Slav or a, you know, or a Jew. You can't have dark skin and be a German Christian. Now we look at that and we say, how in the world could a country as educated as Germany and a country that produced where the Protestant Reformation started, that produced a, one of the greatest theological minds in history like Martin Luther, how in the world could they be led astray and deceived and it's because they listened to the false prophets in their midst and they were enamored with the promises of the false beast you know whenever I read of those events in Germany back in the 1930s it's hard for me not to think of Revelation 13 4 and they worshiped the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who is like the beast and who can fight against it Now we'll turn to the clearest passage in the Bible, verse 18, and learn about 666. It's so easy. I mean, you already know the answer. Can I just skip over it, right? Notice that 666 does not refer to the false prophet. Does not refer to the person whom some call the Antichrist. It refers to the first beast, the first beast out of the sea. But what does 666 mean? That's what everybody wants to know. Here's the bottom line. I don't know for sure. From the second century on, no one in the church has been certain about what 666 means, except people who shouldn't be sure about it. Um, many, many think, though, that 666 refers to a proper name. The name of somebody. There was a practice in the ancient world called gematria, where they would assign numbers to letters, and you could add those numbers up and come up with the number of someone's name. Therefore, a person had their own given name, and they had their quote-unquote number. Years ago, archaeologists uncovered some graffiti in Pompeii, which read, I love her whose number is 545. I mean, you can almost see some hormonally charged teenager carving in his lover's number. I mean, not 8675309, not that kind of number, but her, his number, her number onto a, a wall in Pompeii. But the problem with, with thinking gematria is the way to understand 666 is that you can make anyone's name add up to 666. It's been done all through church history, thousands of people. 
have been listed as possible candidates for this. If you give the person a title, if you abbreviate this part of his name or her name, if you translate it from Greek into Hebrew and back and all these things, you can make, any, you can make J.D. Shaw number 666. I hope none of you are tempted to try. But anybody's name can be that. So my best guess is that when John wrote Revelation, and th this is a guess, I freely admit. I don't know this. So take it for what it's worth. But my best guess is that John, when he wrote Revelation, did not mean for us to try to work out that number like a math problem and come up with someone's name, either from 2,000 years ago or today or in the future. Rather, think of it like this. The number of perfection in Revelation is seven. Divine perfection. The number six historically has meant imperfection. And you string three sixes together, what do you get? Complete and total imperfection. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They're all sixes. They form an evil trinity trying to take the place of God, demanding his worship, but they are a poor, wicked substitute. So John, when he writes in verse 18, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, is saying, do not let yourself be taken in by these phonies. Understand who the beast is. Understand how he plays his games. Watch out for the false prophet and give your worship to the Lord God Almighty alone and to his son Jesus Christ. Okay, now, that's the teachy part of the sermon now. Quickly, we'll do some application before we close. You know, it's one thing to talk about ancient Rome and Nazi Germany and Soviet Union. But I'm sure some of you are thinking, okay, what in the world does this mean for us today? All right, I'll mention three things, three applications. First, we do need a wall of separation between the church and the state. By that, of course, I do not mean we need to advocate to keep prayer to schools or get in God we trust off the dollar bill. Of course, I don't mean that. Rather, what I mean is that Christians must be a prophetic voice calling out our government when it is acting contrary to God's word. But we can't be that voice if we just go uncritically along with any particular candidate for office or political party. You can't be in it completely, sold out to it, and call it out. Christians must have a healthy skepticism about everything done in the name of government. And that's true if either the Democrats or the Republicans are in office. That's the wall of separation I'm talking about. And if you say, but J.D., I'm a Christian now, and I hold office, I'm in office, what about me? Does that mean that I'm part of the problem? And my response is, absolutely not. But, you know, you of all people as a Christian holding public office ought to be aware of how easy it is to get off the tracks. And so you need to check your motives. And you need to check your goals according to God's word. And you need to have people around you who are Christians who aren't afraid to tell you when they think you're wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that Christians never take a stand. To the contrary, Christians need to be able to say, Without qualification and without equivocation, abortion is the taking of a human life. Yet, we must also be able to say, but reasonable people can disagree about how to best end this practice. What we can't say is, if you don't agree with me about every point of policy, you're no Christian. We can't say that. By the way, all the issues around abortion, I just want you to know, they weren't settled and solved on Friday. It was one step. It was one glorious step, but just a step. The battle continues. Christians need to be able to say sex is only proper inside of a marriage between a man and a woman without also saying and if you don't disagree with me about how to enshrine those principles into law, you're no Christian. 
We need to be able to say racism is real, it's wrong, it's evil. We need to be able to say children should never grow up in poverty without also saying, if you don't agree with me about how to end all that stuff, then you're not a believer. Does that make sense? One way I think the false prophet is at work in the church in the United States today is by getting believers to say to other believers, you're no Christian unless you vote exactly the way I vote. Friends, if you hear that, I don't think it's the Holy Spirit speaking. I think it's his, I think it's the evil trinity. His evil substitute, the false prophet, goading you into worshiping the beast. So first, we need that separation. Second, we need wisdom. John says in verse 18, this calls for wisdom. The great danger we face friends, is not death. Right, Christians? Death is not our enemy. Death is our friend as Christians. The great danger we face is deception, being led astray. So how can we keep from being deceived into worshiping the beast? And the answer is by being students, rigorous students of God's Word. Do you know Psalm 1? We used to recite it on Sunday mornings, and we ran out of Sundays, and so we had, to, <laughs> we had to recite. I can't remember how it happened, but we used to recite Psalm 1 one Sunday a month. But it, it talks about a righteous person, and at first in Psalm 1, it describes a righteous person negatively, and it says, you know, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. And so you would think that then the psalmist would say, but the righteous person, you know, He walks with the good people, and he stands with the upright citizens, and he sits in his seat in church every Sunday. But that's not what Psalm 1 says. What's a righteous person? Verse 2 and 3, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. Do you want to be safe from deceit? Then what you need to do is read God's word. Read it and read it and read it and read it and read it. And then read it some more. Never stop reading God's Word so that you are so marinated in it that you begin to think God's thoughts after Him. And I'm telling you, Christians, believers who do that, they are rarely led astray into worshiping the beast. They don't listen to the false prophet. They know his voice because they know their master's voice and they know the difference. And then the third application, we need to ultimately look to God for what the beast says it can provide. I'm indebted to a pastor named Brian Habig for this insight. Do you know why, over the course of human history, so many people have been tempted to worship the beast? The evil power of the devil mediated through the state. Do you know why that is? Because we want to feel safe. You know, we all want to live in a place where Uh, The streets are safe, and the police are on top of everything, and we have the best security system, and a lot of us want to have a big gun safe with, you know, every potential fire, every conceivable firearm in there, and we want to have a strong military, and we want to have good public schools and great hospitals, and, and, and because, and an economy that's roaring along, making us a lot of money, and when that happens, how do we feel? We feel safe. You know, nothing can get to me. Look at, look at all this around me. I'm safe. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of those things I just listed. But the devil is smart. And he knows how to tempt you. And he also knows it's just a short step from desiring those good things to worshiping whoever can give it to you best. It's just a short step. But did you notice that what we read 
right in the middle of Revelation 13. It has to do with safety. Revelation 13, verses 9 and 10. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Now notice, it's not the beast saying that. Who's saying that? That's Jesus. And you see what he's saying? He's saying it may be God's will on earth for you to be unsafe. It may be that you're going to go into captivity. It may be that you're slain with the sword. It may be God's will for you to suffer, but I'm calling you to endure and be faithful just the same. Because, friends, the, fa the fact of the matter is we're not safe. You know that, right? And I'm not saying anybody in this room is going to ever be martyred, but what, what I am saying is cancer can get through even the best doctors. Heartbreak can infiltrate even the safest neighborhoods. Rebellious children can come out of even the best schools. And bankruptcy can happen even when the economy is as strong as you could possibly want it because this world is cursed. This world is broken. The beast can't protect you from any of those things, nor does it want to. It just wants your worship. But Jesus tells us, if you will trust me, if you'll acknowledge your sin and your spiritual poverty and you will trust me, I will make you safe. You may have to suffer a little while here on earth, but I'm going to take you to a place where you will never be unsafe again. You know how the end of Revelation goes? It talks about this place. And this place where Jesus takes his people is described as a great city that comes out of the sky, the New Jerusalem. It's got streets of gold. But the coolest thing about this city is that they never shut the gates. You know, in the ancient world, it was the government's job to shut the gates to keep all the bad people out at night. Where Jesus is going to take his people, he's saying, we don't do gates there. We don't do locks there. We don't worry about doors. We don't worry about security because there's nothing there to fear. I've destroyed it all. The point of Revelation 13 is to get us to go to Jesus and say, I don't want to give anyone else my allegiance. I want to give it all to you, Jesus. I don't want you to have half my heart and the other half of my heart's, you know, really wanting everything to be safe for me here because of the government. I want to give you my whole heart, Jesus, because you alone can give me safety. You alone are worthy of my trust. You alone are worthy of my worship. So friends, I charge you today to go to God this morning through Jesus Christ and worship the only one in the universe who can truly make you safe. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We praise you for your word. I pray that I've been faithful in teaching it. To the extent anything that I've said this morning is contrary to what the Apostle John meant when he wrote the book of Revelation, let it be quickly forgotten. To the extent I've been faithful, though, let these words hit home. We know you've called us to be good citizens on earth, respectful of our leaders, praying for them. Help us to do that. Father, help those Christians who hold office to be faithful to your word. Give us the grace to love our country and be politically involved and advocate for what's right. But all the while, Father, make us wise to the ways of the evil trinity. Don't let us be deceived. Don't allow the beast to divide our churches. Help us, Father to give our allegiance to you and you alone. For only you and your son can ever truly make us safe. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.